Let's jump into today, to today's message. The title of today's message is Dwell. This is a teachings from the Gospel of John. We're going to be reading from John chapter 1, verses 10 through 14. Oh, I did it again. I have scriptures for the Authentic Life Journal, but they're in the printer downstairs. So don't leave church without them, all right? Yeah, thank you. I did say it last time. And last night before I went to bed, I'm like, I got to cut the paper. I got to cut the paper. And here I am. All right. Anyways, uh, so there you go. Uh, so those, are, those will be available at the end. Uh, so today we're continuing. Good thing we're doing a series from John. Otherwise, I'd for, totally forget about those scriptures. Today we're continuing our uh, dwell teachings from Gospel John series. We did a message last week on this. We're going to do another one today. And we'll do another one down the road. All right. And we're going to go uh, through this throughout the year. So let's take a look at our passage today. Uh, of course, again from John chapter 1. Uh, this time, verses 10 through 14. The words will be on the screen both in the room and online. All right, here we go. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Let me read through the first couple lines again. It's where we're going to hang out today. The first, the first sentence, he was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. This passage is profound and highly packed with truth. I would argue most of this first chapter of John can be described this way. But let's give some background to two words that are important. Word, the capital word, as you see at the end of the passage, and world. There is a cause and effect principle with these two words. A.W. Tozer wrote this. We have the word and the world related in this prologue as cause and effect. The world is always an effect. The word is always a cause. And there never is any time when the world is a cause. And there, there never is any time when the word is an effect. The word was and the word made the world. I hope you follow along. I'm, I'm almost losing it. The Logos, which in English translates to word. So when we have our Bible, it's called the Logos. And that's actually just translate simply to word. The Logos made the world. And we will stay by it. So the word and the world. The world you see around about you did not come into existence of itself. But is an effect of that which the Bible calls the word. I got you totally confused now. It's okay. The word, the word, world, needs to be defined for us today. When we think of this, the word world, all right? World, as is written in our text today, of, uh, uh, it's, it's in the first, few, first sentence of our scripture passage. The word world needs to be de defined. World, as is written in our text today, comes from a root word meaning to tend and to take care of. And to provide for. So that word world, it means to tend and take care of and to provide for. This meaning is obvious to us today, but it also means, that word world also means orderly arrangement plus a decoration. Orderly arrangement plus a decoration. So today we will focus in on two of the three meanings for the word world used in John 1 verse 10. These two meanings are this, nature and humanity. So we're going to start off the first with world as nature and then we're going to go to humanity. So world as nature. As we can see from our definition of the word world, as is in our text today, our God is orderly. That's what we draw from this. Our God is orderly. A lot of us take refuge in this truth, but we also use it as an excuse to restrict the moving of the Spirit. Here's what the Scriptures say about order. The Scriptures say in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33, For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. Order, right? So in any aspect of our lives, and even in the life of the church, if there is confusion, God is not a part of it. Have you ever been confused about spiritual things before? I would argue God is not a part of that. Because he's not about, there's no confusion in him. 
So in any aspect of our lives, again, even in the life of the church, there's no confusion if God's a part of it. It actually takes a burden from us, it takes a burden off of us, excuse me, to realize that when our life is filled with confusion, we can immediately realize, we can conclude that we are operating outside of the Spirit of God. I've gone through times in my life where I feel like everything is confusing around me. Well, when I draw on God's word, I realize that God's not really a part of that. There's something else happening in my life. Even in the midst of the storms of life, we can know that if there is no confusion and, and there is peace in the midst of the storm, we know that God is with us. How many times have you gone through the craziest things in life, but there is peace on your spirit? It's because God is with us, right? We should be feeling confused and everything should be chaotic around us, but we have that peace because God is with us. Often when we see confusion, disorder in our world, we will find a person at the heart of the disorder that is in rebellion against God. Let me say it again. Often when we see confusion and disorder in our world, we will find a person at the heart of the disorder that is in rebellion against God. If you have confusion around you, disorder around you, let me just speak this truth to you. There's somebody, could be you, but it could be someone else. There's somebody close to the situation that is in rebellion against God. Our next thought here is this. Our God is beautiful. We often marvel at the artistic capability of many creative artists throughout history. My famous story, I have one famous story with art, is when I lived in England and I would just wander around on my own on my days off. And I went into the, uh, some art gallery in London and I took a photo of a Van Gogh picture. You weren't supposed to do that, but I did. Because I was like, Arlene likes that. So I, this is before we were married. So I was like, I'm gonna take a photo. Anyways, we still have the photo, totally illegal, but I did it. I confessed. The truth is, I didn't really find it all that beautiful or, or interesting. I went through the whole, whole gallery in 20 minutes. Arlene said there was something wrong with me. <laughs> you know, there's people like crying, right? Oh, it's so beautiful. And I'm like, man, that's okay. We just go to the next one. We often marvel at the artistic capability of many creative artists throughout history. The truth is that none compare to our Father in heaven. God makes everything beautiful in his sight. Why is this the case? Why does he make things beautiful? Well, everything God created and creates is created with purpose. Did you know that? Everything that's been created by God, which is like you and me and the, the world around us, God is created with purpose. This purpose brings pure pleasure to God. It makes him feel good. It brings pure pleasure to him. Even the things in our world that seem out of place, God has and can redeem. God will make sure all things that have been created come back to their created purpose. There's things in our world that he's created that you and I, not you and I, but the collective you and I, we've muddied and made evil out of it. But God will bring us back to the created purpose for these things. The reason things are out of place around us is, of course, because of sin. Pastor, why do I hurt? Why are there things in my life I can't explain? Because of sin. Everything, Pastor, everything is explained that way? Yes. Because of sin. Pastor, why is the world around me broken? Because of sin. Why does everything seem unfixable? Nothing goes right. Why? Because of sin. A.W. Tozer wrote, The world God created and the world in which God placed man was perfect and good. It brought great delight and pleasure to the creator. Well, pastor, when was that? Before sin. That's when it was, before sin. The world is supposed to be perfect and good. That's why we can feel a yearning when there's trouble. We hear the rumors of famine and see the news reports of war across our planet. We are grieved by it. And it's because we know in our spirits that the world is supposed to be perfect and good. Why is it not? Because of sin. We know today that uh, it's not possible for this world to be perfect and good because of original sin, which is Adam and Eve. That's why, to this day, our world feels broken. Sin brings disorder, and that disorder is ugliness. 
That's what happens. Let me say it again. Sin brings disorder, and that disorder is ugliness. So, pastor, what do we do? What do we do with what's left? What do we do with all this sin in the world that brings disorder to our lives? Well, God sent the Redeemer, Jesus, to put all things back together. That's why he came. Only those who are redeemed, those who have asked Jesus to be Lord of their life, only those who are redeemed have the ability to like what God likes and to be pleased with what pleases God. I'm inspired by, I, some of you may, may not know this because, you know, I've been around for a while now. I used to be a youth pastor once upon a time. And so I, I follow my students online, right? I see what they do. Now they're having children now, it's kind of weird. Like, it's like, whoa. They used to be 13. Now they're having babies. And they're old enough to have them. It's not like they're just having babies. But I'm like, man, what's up with that? Some of these kids are cute, too. Whew. They're good-looking children. One of my, I, I, call, I call her one of my students, but I'm so proud of her. She's so amazing. She had a tough life growing up. She lived, I won't tell you where she lived. She grew up in one of the places in Toronto that all of you would be scared to go to. And if you weren't scared to go there, it's because you didn't know where you were. All right? You, you see it in the news all the time. She grew up there. She had a rough life. Her mom loved her, but she was a tough lady. She's a tough lady. She actually scared me a little bit, her mom, to be honest with you. Oh, man, when I saw her coming down the hallway, I was like, ooh, watch out. I could get beat this time. I almost did a few times, but she, she was gracious. Anyways, so this, this young, she's a young, young woman, and uh, she, was, she was angry at life when she was a teenager. It didn't matter how much I encouraged her. She would just look at me, and, you know, she was just angry. Remember one day, she met her dad for the first time. She didn't grow up with her dad. She met her dad, and she told me, I met my dad. She was so happy. And yeah, her dad actually lived near me in Toronto, Mississauga. I was like, man, that's great. And I noticed something as the months kind of went on from that point. Man, her life completely changed. She, and and I, like, I'm so proud of her. She was never into terrible stuff. She always studied and worked hard at school, uh, worked hard in, in the job she had, all that kind of stuff. But she went from being this, like, oppressive, down-and-out young lady. Man, she's got the best voice I've ever heard. When she sings, like, angels show up. It's, it's incredible. Like, it's just, I've never heard anyone like it. She doesn't, she doesn't, she doesn't know it. She's very chill about it. We would joke about unleashing her to the church. We did it a few times. It's just an amazingly gifted young woman. And when she met her dad, she met him when she was 19 or 20, something like that. Man, her whole countenance and life changed. It was such a great example of what it is when we meet Jesus to me. Her dad's got lots of problems, and she knows about them all. But just that presence in our life. So when I say only those who are redeemed, those who have asked Jesus to be Lord of their life, God in heaven is our, our Father. Man, every one of us really needs some dads. Good fathers. That's who he is. God likes to be pleased with what pleases God. He likes us to be pleased with what pleases him. I'll tell you this story about this young lady because I was just so proud of her. Grateful that she's still in my life. She works with college students now, teaching them about God. It's so amazing. But that one moment where she met her earthly father just shifted the trajectory of her life. She, she began to glow. Everything changed. And as powerful as that is, where she was kind of able to connect the dots of her life, Jesus is that and so much more in every one of our lives. 
We need Jesus in our life so that we can see the world as God intended it to be seen. Yes, we see the evil, we see the problems, but we can see the good things. God makes everything beautiful in his sight. Think of the beauty of God's creation in this light. Tozer wrote, in creation, God could have made a straight, plain, ugly-looking thing and called it a river. It would have worked, fed the fish, and done all the things a river could do. But God, in his gracious wisdom, took his finger and traced the path of the river, and it allowed it to run around the tree and around the hills and down through a valley and then surrounded it with beautiful trees, bushes, and flowers. He also permitted it to catch the blue of the sky and reflect it as a beautiful mirror. Utility is one thing, and beauty is another. But God is able to make things both useful and beautiful. That is what the word world means when we speak of nature. So at the beginning, I mentioned this dual meaning to the word world, nature and humanity. We've covered the nature, so let's look at humanity. So let's reset with reading John chapter 1, verse 10 again. It says, he was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. So let's look at the world as humanity. The second use for the word world is humanity. This does not refer to anything we see like clouds, the hills, or rivers, as I've just mentioned. It is for humanity that God sent his son to redeem us. When Jesus became incarnate, when he became God-man with us in human form, in flesh, he did not cease being God. He did not cease ever to be what he always was or what he always will be. He didn't become less than to be with us. He was fully man, fully God at the same time. Jesus is the true light, which gives light to everyone. Just as we've read over the last few weeks, I find it interesting that we've been keep on finding ourselves back in Colossians every the last few weeks since Easter. Colossians 1 verse 16, you're going to get sick of it because I've been reading it so much. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. When you come to the truth that Jesus is all things, in all things, work through all, works through all things, your understanding that he is the creator of God shifts. Let me say it again. When you come to the truth that Jesus is all things, he is in all things, he works through all things, your understanding that he is the creator God shifts. Jesus is the beginning and the end. It's him. 1 Timothy 3 verse 16 says, Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. Church, I'm dipping my toes in deep water theologically here, but I want us to get the picture that Jesus is God. He's the only one that can redeem us. Say that to the wrong person these days, you'll get a bit of a look. Jesus is the only one that can redeem us, no matter what anybody says. Any other God that this world puts our way is ultimately dead and cannot redeem us from anything. It's like I said on Easter, I said, this, guy, this guy I follow online, he, he would probably be scared to death that I follow him, but anyways, I, I follow him on Instagram, and he posts this, he's a Christian guy, uh, Post this fo- photo of uh, gods of our world and how you can find all their graves, and they're there. But our God is empty, right? Because he is alive. Any other God that this world puts our way is ultimately dead. They don't, they're not alive. You can slap whatever modern catchphrase you want onto it. Truth only finds itself in the hands and work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's it. He is not here. He is risen. We don't just say it because, oh, let's say it. No, no, it means something. Again, Tozer writes, the all-permeating word which is in the world is the adhesive quality of the universe. That is why we do not fall apart. He is to the universe the mortar and the magnetism that holds it all together. He holds up his universe. That is what he is doing in this universe. That is why he is here. This is not a dead world that we inhabit. Only sin is a dead thing. Did you know that? The only dead thing in this world is sin. That's it. This is a living 
dream world that we inhabit, a spiritual world, held together by the spiritual presence of the invisible word. So Jesus holds all of this together. The only dead thing in this world is sin. Well, that's dead. The truth is, no, it's not. We took out some dirt. Some of you say, I'm as old as dirt. I found that dirt yesterday. It was in the front foyer of the, the front doorway of the church. All these years, we, we had no idea. Well, some of you did, but we found the dirt older than everybody here. The only dead thing in this world is sin. Don't be deceived. Sin is what kills and destroys every aspect of our lives. It's so important for you and I to grasp the greatness of God. What is Jesus doing now? What, like, what is he doing this very second? In Hebrews 1 verse 3, we read, He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. That is an incredible picture for us today. I think it's my biggest concern, certainly one of them. We are so convinced we know everything these days. We're just, as a society, we're so convinced. So many of us, it doesn't matter what faith background we have, spiritual or not, educated or not, well-read or not well-read, we are all so convinced that we know everything. We have such arrogance at times. We used to make fun of my grandfather because every time he had a question, he'd go to his computer and Google it, right? He you know, well, and he gets the answer. Well, I was noticing the other day, anytime my kids have a question, they ask one of the dinguses in the house. I call that's what I call them. The things that talk back to you, right? You know those things you have some of those sorts your phone does it, all, like whatever, right? Yeah, don't say it. It's a bad word. Um, <laughs> so they, they ask the dingus. The question. So they don't, they don't even have to get up to their computer anymore. They just sit at the table, shout out questions. It's annoying. Like, I don't want to know these answers. We really think we have everything in our lives figured out. Do you know that uh, there's an organization, I think they're based out of the States, uh, artificial intelligence technology has gotten so advanced, they actually told them to stop developing it in the last month. Because it's so, it's so crazy what's going on. They, they can't keep up with it. And there's some people, this will scare you to death, there's some people that actually think the artificial intelligence in computers has gone, like, come alive, basically. And it's doing things on its own. Crazy, right? So next time you hear the politicians say, oh, this is okay, we got it under control. <laughs> we really think we have everything in our lives figured out. Imagine that. We've got it all figured out, but the computers have taken over. Now we're in that sci-fi movie we used to think, oh, that's kind of scary. As long as the Terminator doesn't appear, we'll be good. <laughs> Sorry, I had to do it. Okay. <laughs> Many of us walk like we have all the answers, right? Yes, some of us pretend that we're humble and say, oh, we don't know everything. <laughs> I have a lot to learn. The world around us tells us that we can boil everything down to a scientific principle that we can prove or disprove. I'm not picking on science. I'm just... Here's an uncomfortable truth the Bible teaches us about our lives and the world we live in. The universe, the world, are simply in the hands of Jesus. Jesus is holding the whole world together. Colossians 1 verse 17 says, And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Many of you know I love watching the stars at night in our area, because, you know, it's beautiful, right? It's such a blessing to see the sky so filled with stars on a clear night. It's humbling when you look up to those stars, and you think Jesus holds all things, even the stars, by the word of his power. As he speaks, those things shift. Think about that. When, I, when you and I speak, does anything really happen? Eh. If you have kids, no. <laughs> right? If you have grandkids, maybe. But he upholds all things, even the stars, by the word of his power. This same God calls you and me by name. Isn't that amazing? And he knows the name of every star in the sky. 
Psalm 23, you know so well. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. When we think of those stars again, Tozer writes, this is the most majestic and elevated figure of speech in the entire Bible, with no possible exception. We can look into the starry sky and know that astronomers have told us that the very Milky Way is not a Milky Way at all, but simply a confusion of stars so many billions of light years away, all moving in an orderly direction. And God called them all out. And he knows their number and calls them all by name just as a shepherd calls his sheep. Our last thought today, Pastor Chris and Tyler, if you could help me out here. Presence and light. Church, God is with us. Let's take a look at the rest of our text today. We focused on the first verse that we had today, verse 10. The rest of it says in verse 11, He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those he believe in his name. I'm glad he he gave everyone the right to become children of God. I'm not Jewish, so I wouldn't be in the family, if you know what I mean. I'm glad he, he, (laughs) thank you, Lord. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. One commentator wrote, how is the word made flesh? Well, by the miracle of the virgin birth. He took on himself sinless human nature and identified with us in every aspect of life from birth to death. The word was not an abstract concept of philosophy, but a real person who could be seen, touched, and heard. Christianity is Christ, and Christ is God. Think about that. The word was not an abstract concept of philosophy, but a real person who could be seen, touched, and heard because some of us can't feel him Jesus or see him or hear him we are tempted to simply conclude he doesn't exist some of us have convinced ourselves and maybe others that God doesn't exist it's impossible that's how we lead our own lives some of us we've given ourselves the pleasures of our flesh anything that will take the seriousness out of living life is hard right? I don't know anyone in this room, online, Little Current, that doesn't know that. Life is hard. We can dress in the nicest clothes, drive the nicest vehicle, our homes may be more than we can afford, and not one thing we possess is more than a year old. We may be receiving promotions and be expecting that everything is about to turn in our favor. In our hearts, though, we know and can see that we are broken people. We lack substance. We lack purpose. So what I'm trying to say is that we can have everything we want in life. We still lack substance and purpose. I'm going to say it wrong, but Jim Carrey has this quote that he said he wished everyone could be super rich so they could find out that there's nothing there. Do you know that statistically to get everything you want just means you double your yearly earnings? That would give you everything you want. Is that enough? Church, in our hearts, we remember that we are broken people. We lack substance and purpose without Jesus. Today we can hear the call that there is 
a presence and a voice that lights each one of our hearts and spirits. His name is Jesus. The basis of our lives is not physical or material things. It's spiritual. We owe our lives to God, so today we can choose once again to surrender to him. Matthew 11, verse 28 says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Mark 12, verse 34 says, And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Uh, First, 1 John 3, verse 1, See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. So today, I want to do something a little different. In a moment, I'm going to invite everyone to stand, and Pastor Chris is going to lead us in a a, a time of worship. During that time of worship, I want us to respond to this message, and I want us to respond in this way. It's time for us to surrender again to Jesus, to go on our knees in prayer, submitting ourselves to his power and authority. You could call, I, I'm, in a, I'm in a message series, so I don't have to give the message a title specifically every week. This is part three. That's what the title is. But if I were to give it a title, we could call it, just get down on your knees and pray, surrender to Jesus. Maybe you're like me and this is another opportunity. You've done it before, but it's another opportunity to surrender to him. Maybe you're here and you're maybe thinking for the first time today. Maybe in your little current, maybe you're watching from home. You found us on Facebook somehow. Who are these people? It's an opportunity for us to get down on our knees, pray, and surrender to Jesus. You know, there's a, a thing I used to do a lot more than I have done recently. But when you bow down, it actually means to get your head where your brain is below your heart. The heart is the closest to God in heaven, so to speak. It doesn't really mean anything, but it's a it's a good principle, right? We want to get our heart there first, right? Just surrender to Jesus today. John 1, verse 14. I read it a couple times already today, but it says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's why this series is called Dwell. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. And every one of us needs a fresh dose of grace today. That's the truth. So stand with me. Pastor Chris, would you lead in a moment? I'm going to pray. And anyone that wants to come with me, this is not a, a, like a super spiritual place up here. But if you want to come and kneel at the altar with me, it's just an act of surrender. There's something that happens when we move from the place where we are, maybe in, well, in a seat right now, up here. Something happens in the spiritual atmosphere. I can't explain it. Uh, there are lots of things I can't, but it happens. And we're going to surrender to Jesus. So I invite you to come and join me as I finish praying. You can come right now. I don't care. But uh, when I finish praying, you can come forward as well. So God, I just thank you for today. And Lord, you've led us to surrender today. And Lord, I, I know there's no doubt in my mind with the people that we minister to on a weekly basis. But God, there's somebody here today that needs to surrender their life to Jesus for the first time so that they can see the good in this world through your eyes for the first time. And Lord, there's many, many, many people here just like me who we need to surrender our lives to you again. We need to leave our ambitions, our burdens, the weight we carry. We need to leave it right here at the altar. We need to surrender Say, God, you are in control. I'm not. So, Father, today, whether it's those in our Little Kern campus, those watching church online, or those gathered in this room today, Lord, I always think of the one or two people that hear this message for the first time, like on Wednesday or Thursday this coming week. God, would you work in our spirits? Would you lead us to surrender? 
again, to surrender our goals, our dreams, our ambitions, not because they're bad, but just because they need to fall under your leading, Lord, your plan for our lives. And Lord, again, just feel it even as I'm speaking that there's, there's folks that don't want, there's some of us that don't want to surrender. I don't know what we're hanging on to, but there's some of us, we just, we just don't want to surrender. So God, today as Pastor Chris leads us, I just pray that your spirit would be upon us and with us as we surrender once again. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen.